Welcome to Disinformation. I'm Richard Metzger. On tonight's show, you'll meet an extraordinary character, my dear friend Howard Bloom. In the 1980s, Howard Bloom was the top publicist in the music industry with clients like Joan Jett, Michael Jackson, and Prince. His career was legendary, but in 1988, Howard fell ill with chronic fatigue syndrome and has been bedridden ever since. Despite his illness, Bloom typed out the scientific theories he'd been thinking about his entire life. His incredible book, The Lucifer Principle, makes the case that nature has organized all life forms into complex teams which compete with each other in eternal biological conflicts. The Lucifer Principle looks us squarely in the eye and confronts us with the cold and clammy facts. War, death, hatred and violence are necessary parts of the genetic plan, integral elements of life and of creation itself. I could try to convince you that Howard Bloom is next on a very short list that includes Darwin, Einstein, and Buckminster Fuller, and how he's going to change the way we see ourselves and everything around us. But Howard can probably do a much better job of convincing you himself. Howard, I'm wondering if you could explain the concepts behind your book, The Lucifer Principle. Well, The Lucifer Principle says that there are basically a trinity of things that drive us. And the trinity of things that drive us are the superorganism, ideas, and the pecking order. Basically, when you put those things together, you've got a conceptual lens through which you can see history in a radically different way. What's a superorganism? Okay, what's a superorganism? Uh, let's take um, a sieve and we'll take two sponges. We take the two sponges and we run them through a sieve into a bucket of water. What we discover is that these sponges are not the solid things we thought they were. They're actually collections. They're actually nations of cells, of independent cells. And when we strain them through the stainer, the independent cells go their own way. They're perfectly self-contained. They can handle life on their own. They don't need a community, but they do need a community. They need community so badly that they will gather together. They, right now, they're a soup. They're just a soup within the liquid, but they will gather together and reconstruct their communities uh, over the course of the next day or two until we once again have not one, but two solid sponges in the bottom of the bucket, just as solid as they ever were before. Why? Among other things, they've reconstructed not just a community, but their original community. The yellow sponges have all gathered with yellow sponges over on one side of the bucket, and they made one solid yellow sponge. The red sponges have gathered on the other side of the bucket, and all it's just red sponges, red sponges from top to bottom. But it's a solid object. Not only do the sponges have a deep need for community, one so deep that they confuse us, that they actually manage to fool us into thinking that they are a consistent whole, but they have a deep need for identity to be with others like themselves. If a red one catches himself in the middle of a bunch of yellows, first of all, the yellows aren't going to want him very much, and secondly, he's not going to want to be there. Is this a sort of sponge racism? It's very much a sponge racism. As a matter of fact, if you can't get rid of it among sponges, then you certainly can't get rid of it among human beings who are a good deal more complex. What you have to do is move the kind of racism move it from the kind of racism that we see in Zaire, where racism means killing 500,000 people with machetes, or in Kosovo, where it means driving out a million people, to the kind of racism we have in the United States, which seems to us to be an appalling thing, but in reality is not, because if you compare it with those two racisms, we do not go after each other with machetes. We go after each other with words. Even the Reverend Elijah Muhammad used to go after me, a Jew, who's, you know, child spawn of Satan, with words. He never came after me with a blade. He never came after me with a machete. He never burned my house down. If we can, get, we can get racism, which is inevitable, down to the level of discourse, then we've accomplished an incredible thing. Howard, one of the more radical notions in the Lucifer Principle, and this idea seems to fly in the face of what are, what are the currently acceptable schools of the social sciences is that our violent behavior comes not from our monkey ancestry but from our microbial ancestry. Our original ancestors were bacteria, cyanobacteria, 3.5 billion years ago. Uh, primates of our kind have been around for at most about 16 million years. Primates like us have been around. We 
have only been around for 100,000 years, which is an absolute nothing. But the fact is, you could already see in the initial colonies of cyanobacteria that one group of cyanobacteria would go to war against a different kind of bacteria, that they would actually use poison warfare. They would use the weapons of mass destruction that we talk about. They would put out various forms of poisoners that would destroy their enemies, but would not touch them. And one of the examples in the Lucifer Principle comes, comes well, a good deal further forward in history. Not only do we find these things among um, the 3.5 billion year old bacteria, we find them in these creatures. Well, if you've ever walked out on the um, shoreline, you'll find tidal pools. And the tidal pools are absolutely magical places. Inside of them, they have the most wonderful looking fluorescent little finger tubules. They just barely move in the water. And you could watch these things for hours. They could become the picture of paradise. Look how beautifully they get along with each other. Well, they don't. They don't get along with each other. Sea anemones live in colonies. In fact, you can find vast, vast mats of them. Those are huge, huge communities. Now, the sea anemones on the inside have the job of finding the food and absorbing it. But then there's a periphery of sea anemones, which are basically sea anemone warriors. And they are built to kill. Who are they built to kill? Other sea anemones. They're built to battle constantly for new territory with other sea anemones. We don't notice it because it takes place on a time scale to which we are not accustomed. However, if we were to fast forward it, you know, take one frame every three minutes and do time-lapse photography, you would see a battle going on on a monumental First World War, Second World War scale among sea anemones. If it goes on among sea anemones, how the fuck are we going to get away from it? So are we born with original sin? We are born as fingertips of evolution. And there is a problem with being fingertips of evolution. Evolution is one of the most creative processes we've ever seen. We started in the first 10 to the minus 30 seconds of the Big Bang with nothing. We started with a ripple in something called a false vacuum. Just a little tiny ripple, and it was tiny. It was infinitesimal. And from that time on, we've ended up with subatomic particles. Whole new invention, radically different than anything that had ever existed before. Atoms. Again, a giant step up, one small step for subatomic particles, one giant leap for universe kind. Um, then we've moved to molecules, planets, suns, galaxies, and entire systems of galaxies, not to mention human beings like you and me. Um, there's a small problem, though, with this evolutionary process, especially as it applies to um, living things. In living things, the process goes according to, well, it's what uh, was called the evolution red in tooth and claw. There's been a lot of debate about whether that was some sort of Victorian misnomer. It's not a Victorian misnomer. Um, if a lion wants to feed her children, which is a wonderful and benevolent thing to do, any lion mother who doesn't want to feed her children is a child abuser or a cub abuser, as the case may be. Uh, but if she wants to go and feed her child, what does she want to have to do? She has to bring down a gazelle. And then she has to start to tear its guts out while its eyes are still rolling in its head and still very, it's still very alive and it's still very aware of what's going on in the last seconds of its life. So which is it? Is she an abuser if she refuses to take down gazelles and starves her children? Or is she the abuser if she insists on going after some gazelle and ripping it limb from limb while it's still alive? She has no choice. One way or the other, she has to be red in tooth and claw. We are children of the evolutionary process. And the evolutionary process happens to work by using destruction for creation. It's like a sculptor. In the book, it says that, that um, nature and evolution are very much like a sculptor. You take a piece of marble, and it's one giant unified thing. You take a chisel to it. What could be more destructive? You take a chisel and a hammer to it, and you begin to chisel and chisel the flakes away. You don't give a damn for the flakes on the floor. You don't think, you know, is that a flake in pain? Is that flake uh, having emotional problems because it's been isolated? No, you just simply smash at 
the parts that need to be taken away in order to create the Michelangelo masterpiece that's implicit in the piece of marble. Well, unfortunately, the marble on which nature works, on which evolution works, consists of you and me and the amoeba in the pail and other living beings, and or the antelope that's taken down by the mother uh, lion. And we have feelings. And every one of us feels, I have a right to live. And I have a right not to be treated with savagery. I have a right not to have my guts torn out so that I can be fed to lion cubs. And indeed, we do have that right, which means that basically evolution has built something disastrous into us. It's built something absolutely diabolical into us. If you want to say this, it has built the devil into us. Not original sin, but the fucking devil itself. <laughs>
and makes us retreat within ourselves. Makes us retreat to dream worlds within ourselves. Ideas of flying saucer people coming to save us, ideas of spirituality. I mean, ideas of spirituality are basically ideas that a fantasy. They involve withdrawing into yourself and believing in a heaven and a hell that we've never seen and have no evidence for. Whereas in other periods of history, people become curious about the outside world rather than retreating to these inside fantasies. Well, I see us retreating to these inside fantasies. The fantasies of the day when Kosovo was the Jerusalem of the Serbs. Um, the fantasies of the days when the Aryan race ruled. These are the kinds of fantasies that are dominating people now, and you can see them in the hate groups that you've tracked. I mean, you've been a very instrumental figure in tracking the fringe groups. That's, that's the group where the new passions of the next generation are seething and boiling right now. Those are the groups which will someday move to the center and take over if we don't watch out. And they are hate groups. They are hate groups with ancient tribalisms. And they are violently against science. And they're out there all over the place. These are the new tribalisms. But there is another possibility. And I've only seen it recently. And I've seen it because some of the meetings that you and I have had with various people under the age of 20. I've seen that those people have this massive hole in their soul, and they have built their personalities around cynicism. Cynicism means simply aping or putting into an ironic form, mocking existing institutions instead of building institutions of your own. What I've discovered is because these people have such a deep need for something to believe in, that if someone like you, who has a powerful set of beliefs, or someone like I, who has a powerful set of beliefs. I mean, I've, ser I've been searching the gods all my life. Now I know them, the gods inside of us, or I feel I do. Um, someone like me or you, who can come along and show these people that there is a meaning to life, that there are things worth believing in, that there are things worth being passionate about, they respond immediately. Now, we're either going to have the new Adolf Hitlers coming along, who know how to manipulate this need and do it with the new nationalisms and the new tribalisms and the new hate groups, or we're going to have a you or a me who will come along and pour a positive message, a positive sense of something to believe in, a positive crusade for emotionality. I've always thought there was something of the Messiah in you, Howard. Well, there has to be something in the Messiah, because the only messiahs who exist are us human beings. We human beings are all basically cockroaches at heart. That is to say, we're insecure when we're alone by ourselves. We have all kinds of self-doubts. We have our depressions. And we have all kinds of reasons to believe that we're nobody at all. But it's nobodies at all who become the Isaiahs of the world. It's the nobodies at all who become the Einsteins of the world. It's the nobodies at all who become the Jesus Christs of the world. And it's incumbent on us, having learned the lesson, and we've been able to learn a lesson from the history of Christianity. Jesus put together a movement that was based on respect for the humble and the poor, on seeing their possibilities, on seeing that they had to be treated as human beings too. But what happened to his message? When it was taken over 322 years later by Constantine, Constantine had the, the cross painted on the shields of his men. And suddenly, Christianity became an excuse for mass murder. Christ would never have allowed that. OK, we know that now. And we know that Christ was just as human as anything, anybody else. Why did he cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me when he was on the cross? Because he was insecure about everything he had believed in up till then. He was as human as we are. It's up to human beings to be the messiahs. We're the only ones who are there to do it. And we have to do it. We have to do it. Because if we don't do it, somebody with an equal belief and passion to ours, who believes that the way to achieve things is through the old animal way, the old animal way built into our limbic system, built into the lower parts of our brain, to who, who knows that the best way to unite people is by uniting them in hatred against an outside group and uniting them in mass murder. We have to come along before that person comes along. We have to fill that void. and We have to fill it with positivity. It's about going, digging into the elemental passions. The mandate of paleopsychology is to trace the evolution of thought, of mentation, 
and emotion from the first 10 to the minus 30 seconds of the Big Bang on up to the present. And to trace social phenomena from the moment of the Big Bang up to the present. All of this plays a part in trying to give to the new generation a movement that's based on something extraordinarily passionate that you can powerfully believe in, that you can use to advance humanity tremendously, absolutely tremendously, but that excises deliberately the god of war. When you find the gods inside yourself, you'll find the god of war. You'll find the god of bloodlust. You'll find the god of genocide. And he will be one of the most powerful passions in you. And you have to knife him out of existence. You have to freeze him in his own private hell and make your positive gods the gods that take you over. And by the gods that take you over, I mean you have to find those passions that are so much more powerful in you than anything you've been allowed to express in your life and making those things the things you work on. In other words, not putting off until you're 40 or 50 the things you feel passionate about at the age of 15 and 16, but going directly to those things and trying to implement them when you're 20. Pass, go. Forget the $200. Go directly to Park Place and put your life there on the line with all the emotion and power and passion and insight in you. And fuck the god of war. This is the Dream Machine, a kinetic sculpture designed to be looked at with your eyes closed. Invented by painter Brian Geisen, the Dream Machine projects psychedelic patterns onto your eyelids, which then get projected directly into your mind. After about 25 minutes with the Dream Machine, the user experiences a fall into a tunnel of color, shapes, and swirling visuals. Egyptian hieroglyphics, cave paintings, and Deglo mandalas are common motifs and experiences with the Dream Machine, but more esoteric results can also occur. Touted as a drugless turn-on during the 1960s, the Dream Machine was patented by Geisen but never made in great number due to the cost of production. That's all changed recently due to the efforts of Los Angeles-based composer David Woodard, which you can read about at his davidwoodard.com website. Author William Burroughs thought the Dream Machine was a creativity enhancer and called it a cure for writer's block. Kurt Cobain owned a Dream Machine, Iggy Pop owns one, and Genesis Peorage, a close friend of Geisen's, published a blueprint of the machine during his Temple of Psychic Youth days. It's worth mentioning here that Nostradamus got his prophetic visions using a trick similar to the way the Dream Machine works, that involves staring at the sun. Can you see the future with a Dream Machine too? For more information on the Dream Machine, the music of David Woodard and his other strange science fiction devices like the Wishing Machine, check out davidwoodard.com. How do you think the invention of the internet will cause mutation in the human race? Well, I mean, one thing that uh, is often discussed is how marriages are breaking up now because of online romance. Marriage is obviously going to change dramatically. Male-female relationships are going to change dramatically. Males and females are able to find themselves on the basis of the synchronicity of their souls. Now, back to the red and the yellow um, sponges again, and the fact that the red, those red independent cells manage to find other red independent cells and form a community, and yellow independent cells manage to find yellow independent cells and find a community. Well, we have a huge porridge of individuals. We have been sieved as thoroughly as the sponges were sieved uh, by the internet, and we've been allowed to then find our way to people who resonate to our frequency in some deep, deep emotional way. 